Thank you, Neringa. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, Neringa, and all the Sodis team for being wonderful and uh, having me tonight. Um, I'm going to be um, very quick about this introduction because I thought maybe today I could just uh, present um, my recent work and I selected uh, three projects, the, the most recent projects I did also. Um, please come in, come in. Uh, there will be some readings, some um, screenings of the videos and uh, please be patient with me because I have to be dragging everything over there. So I'm just going to do it one by one. Um, you can find a seat and then, yeah, please do. Neither Tales of Progress or Ruin tells us how to think about collaborative survival. The story is sticky. It is dreams and hallucinations and pain and an endless hunting. Or a sense of the bodies of the women on the ground. Their bodies searching slick in mud hands splitting grass to check. Hope is wasted energy. They are frantic, twisted, leaps close to the ground as though breathing for it. The hands of the young girls are creased by mud, gaining new texture shaped by the knife they hold, primed for digging. The geography of the mountain is restless. We are all given an identity we did not choose. Gender is moved by the lungs, ground up by the mouth, chewed down, and then spoken 
but identity, place, memory, and ecology are biographical. It is the presence of the past, present, and future. I dream about the women on the mountain, crowds of flesh and material crawling with no sense of what part of them is a body or what part of any body belongs to them. A small girl is swallowed by the mass, becomes part of the ground they search upon. At first, you can hear her calling but it's not for mother or for help, and is quickly, sorry, and is quickly dissolved into the sounds of the others as they sing their successes, a muted impersonal sound. Their breathing will slow as they crawl higher, their blood thickening in their veins, making them heavy. Their movements ugly, out of sync with their intent. A mother notices an absent child whose body is now the red dust beneath them. A whale vibrates over the mass, making their backs arch and causing them to crawl as though an insect prickling in the fence. They move at once together. The ground is unsettled and forced into the air where it hovers as a cloud over them. It is a stiff climb up the mountain, one hand on an improvised walking stick, the other meeting thigh with every step. I can hear the others breathing beside me. Our breathing becomes discipline, application, a strangulating regulation of the spiritual collective. With every step, I can feel a stitch catch. Could this be a merciless punishment to the body that observes the destruction of ritual? Tibetan monks were the one who first to voice danger. The hunt was no spiritual quest. It was a contagion, leaving people in conflict with their geography, dissolving the practice of ritual and disrupting mythology. The harvesting of cordyceps would upset spirits of the mountain and earth, causing death and bad luck in the family of the collector. I can't feel any side effects, although, even if I do feel them, I can't find any information about what the eating of the infected caterpillar might do. I eat the entire body, which I know to be illegal in some parts of Nepal. The eyes crunch, unlike the rest of the body. It tastes earthy and sticks in my teeth. I wonder where the potency is lost if the entire body is not digested at once. My dreams are still disturbed and anxiety does not wane. But I feel I am able to live divided, now performing two lives. One of work and another as an observer. She bleeds on the second day, so has to be sent back. My tongue is so cursed in my mouth that I expect to choke, but instead it rolls by my cheeks, coating my palate with pine, and I am somehow swallowing. I can barely split my teeth to say goodbye. 
We had dreamt of Chopadi, of blood spilling between our thighs and what it would mean. And this is what it feels like. Isolation, separation, and then focus. Although none of this is my own, I am alone, I am movement, I am doing the thing I thought I would never do. Back in the forest, Shiva is angry. We take from his forest, but we were not to be allowed here before. The Yasha Gumbu has scattered further, leading us across his land. It fears us, and our mouths are numbed by its bitterness. The word for world is forest, Giri calls to me. My fingers are long to hook and curl. My body is open for more money. Fungus eating is generous and bizarre. It makes worlds for others. They smile and we lead further into the trees. I say the name again in my head. Again and again. Shopadi. Mushroom tracks are elusive, but hungry. Their movement performs the future of our body, of our economy. And they are constantly searching for a body. It's ventriloquism, really. The fungus moves the body and becomes it too. They stretch out, extending their body into the hosts, manipulating its behavior and sometimes making them attract predators, manipulating their environment and our bodies. The fungus wants to be devoured and will take its host's body with it. For all these reasons, they are parasites. The bodies at the mountain camps are women, children and men too, although not many of these. And the fungus spreads underground and through the air. That's what running things. If you make the soil liquid and transparent and walk into the ground, you would find yourself surrounded by nets of ivy. Like a dance, a pattern of movement. The fungi create airflow by allowing their moisture to evaporate, which cools them off, which uses up energy from heat. Cold air is dense, it flows and spreads out, and the entire process creates water vapor, which is lighter than air, so the spores can disperse, horizontally and vertically. The fungus creates wind, manage their own transport system, have crafted a way to get around and influence growth, to take over, a powerful contamination really, experimental fluid mechanics. The camp trade in cordyceps swap fungi for food or sex for food when the hunt is poor. And the greatest hunters are female. It was their fingers and their weariness. Cordyceps are where Nepalese money comes from. So the female body pays. 
But all over Nepal, people disappear too. The children of the hunters who are forced to sell sex at the camps because the cordyceps are more valuable and become pregnant. Their babies are denied citizenship because of a lack of a clear father, so they belong to nowhere. Or the Dalits, the untouchables and the taboo of women who menstruate and threaten the purity of the cordyceps are banished. Back to the village until the impurity ceases. The contaminated contaminate. No touching of the house or of anything that might prohibit their collecting. At least this was tradition. But the cordyceps have changed the economic base of Nepal and so have changed culture. People choose either cultural practice or income. As a younger generation flood the fields, searching, hunting, tradition and rules are broken. The young are not willing to keep up with this orthodox ways. The cordyceps graze in high altitude, moving further up the mountain as the environment has changed. In humans, High altitudes deplete the availability of oxygenated blood. The kidney sends warning signals to the spine, making the bone marrow produce more red blood cells. This surge in oxygenated blood allows the body to perform at its peak, as though as an athlete. Energy levels will rise. However, extended periods of time in high altitude causes the blood to thicken and become sticky with these extra cells, eventually slowing. Fainting is common, as is dizziness, nausea, aching limbs, nosebleeds, and vomiting. The body evacuates itself. Sufferers can experience problems with memory, exhaustion, and a loss of clarity of thought. It makes sense, then, that the collectors become fanatic. The collectors pick, but to collect in Nepal requires a license or permit. It comes with a cost to the government and at a cost to the female body. Grass with its own shadow hangs thick over the lives of young women, offering freedom, offering entrapment. So this piece um, is called Death Grip. It's part of, uh, I'm just gonna stop this here. So I think a bit late. Um, this, this work is actually from an installation I did in 2019. And I'm just gonna open some pictures so you can see how it looks like. Uh, so this was um, an installation. The sound was actually like um, spaced and sort of like distributed in 18 channels. So this was more or less like a compressed stereo file um, with me talking on top. But you could somehow like walk around the room uh, with two animations. Um, it, it was a piece I did uh, during a residency in, in India and it sort of um, started with um, this residency but also um, parallel with the time where my, my grandmother was uh, battling the second cancer. So I had this, uh, this idea that I could go on a mission to find um, uh, this very precious, uh, rare medicine called cordyceps, which is actually a parasitic fungus, a sort of an alien fungus. Um, 
and I wanted to know a little bit more about it and this research ended up actually um, going for a longer period uh, where I had the opportunity to um, follow a group of workers um, who were in charge of the whole sort of uh, market and the whole sort of like system uh, to harvest cordyceps. And the cordyceps, I don't know if you heard about something called the zombie fungus, but it's something that uh, usually involves this sort of like parasite host relationship and it could be insects um, or you know any sort of like ants from ants caterpillars uh, wasps it can sort of contaminate different animals and um, I was really interested into um, in writing like a, a sci-fi short story with it which was more or less what I tried to present uh, today and um, and also like to find a little bit more about uh, this natural resource, which apparently was becoming extinct there. So I traveled through the Himalayan regions in India and Nepal, um, and I was writing and uh, filming and recording a lot of stuff like during this trip. Um, but also like I really, I really have um, interest into sort of like culminating ideas of what what is the parasitism in society in sort of like bringing Marx um, or Michel Serre or um, the Luz ideas sort of like around this um, parasitism, but also like uh, the body without organs or this sort of like fungus cycle uh, that starts by contaminating um, a host and then this parasite consumes the whole body of the caterpillar um, and the sort of alien process starts because uh, it sort of like controls the mind of its hosts so it's a very interesting and complex chemical reaction and uh, relationship that exists between the parasite and the hosts and then basically what workers do they sort of like crawl in the grass in high altitudes in the mountain to, f to find a little mushroom that sort of like sticks out the earth, the soil. And this mushroom mimics the shape of the grass that it's around it. So it's very hard to sort of find and it. You need to be very precise and delicate to pick it out. So I, I was really like fascinated by this whole market and this whole economy that uh, it's very important in Nepal and it's called the soft gold. So it's it's kind of like a very important medicine um, used in Ayurvedic and Chinese um, sort of like traditional medicine. And um, I, I was also like um, kind of like interested in, in, the, um, in the way the cordyceps operates mimetically because it's both herb, animal, and fungi, you know, it's kind of like goes through this like sort of like hybrid uh, formations, but also with this form of um, behavioral manipulation um, of, of the host. So the harvesting of the cordyceps involves the largest number of low income, poor and working class people in these countries. Based on the involvement of the rural community in its extraction and trading, this indicates that the caterpillar fungus is a symbol of poverty. Two months of hard labor equates to surviving the rest of the year. Uh, in the areas where nomadic communities participate in the fungus collection and in trade, the grand influx of cash has profoundly impacted daily lives, changing livelihood systems and local economies. So part of the field work I did in, in Nepal was also sort of like understand what kind of like effects from pollution to obviously change in the landscape, climate change, but what what kind of effects were actually uh, happening there? What kind of transformations? Um, so, healers and local people prescribe the mushroom as a single drug or combined with other herbs. I I tried it myself, um, so I could bring also some to to be part of the sort of like therapeutic process. Um, of my grandmother and um, other people further claim that uh, it's also an aphrodisiac so apparently people 
treated also for like some sort of like sexual dysfunctional problems and things like that. Um, but I was also like super interested in the fact that um, some women um, are also like uh, sex workers uh, in the camps uh, during the process of the harvesting, which is usually between May um, and July, and they can exchange the cordyceps, the fungi, as uh, currency. So I was really trying to understand what kind of like modes of circulation of this natural resource was really happening, and was the main sort of like uh, um, the main sort of like drive for for this piece. Um, I also uh, sort of like thought about Marcel Mao's theories about gift econo economy because it was also like traded and offered as a gift between families or friends or business. So if you see it on the internet as like really interesting uh, sort of like gift packaging for that, it's really bizarre. Um, but uh, Marcel Mao's focus on the fact that exchanging gifts between groups builds relationships and always implies reciprocity, right? So according to him, the transactions between giver and receiver transcend the division between the spiritual and the material in a way that is almost magical in this sense. Um, plus the rituals that are performed somehow to initiate this harvesting um, uh, moment. The giver does not merely give an object, but it's also a part of herself or himself, since the gift is indissolubly tied to the giver. Eastern cultures and now the rest of the world moved into a sustained interest of consuming it to increase vitality, cure cancer and help with sexual disorders. So the demand for this resource has skyrocketed, making it uh, the most expensive biological medicine in the world. The majority of the fungus is taken illegally to, ta uh, to Tibet and to other countries through India, where it is illegal to sell. China is the main consumer and is also responsible for trading it globally as a traditional Chinese medicine, since there are no processing facilities in, Nep in Nepal, sales are mostly illegal. Um, so this, this idea of like the contaminated can contaminate also came from the fact that, you know, um, People with uterus that menstruate are not allowed to continue their labor, their work. So they are taken away to the forest or taken away from everything uh, that is sort of like the, the communal areas. And I, I was really shocked by that. So somehow there are like all these facts and um, stories that were somehow feeding uh, the writing I was doing at the time. And um, my main interest uh, was also to analyze the role of gender in this economy and think of its relation to the history of capital. And I wanted to document and also create fiction uh, by observing their daily lives, uh, the sexual hierarchies and their hardships. This would not have been possible without mentioning the violence experienced by government governmentality and religion. There are a lot of myths and taboos in the Hindu religion. Um, so for example, some say it's a bad omen for business if women in the family are menstruating and they touch the fungus or anything sacred, like a home, for example. Uh, uh, they are excluded from the production cycles and uh, sent away to live in a hut, exposed to the dangers until the period is over, relying often only on their family members for food provisions, etc. But I, I was also thinking about this sort of monstrous host um, image. Um, as you can imagine, you can sort of like picture uh, a caterpillar of a moth that is sort of like being consumed inside and becoming like a mushroom inside and then having like a mushroom exploding from the head. This is more or less what you have to eat uh, as a medicine. But um, I was also thinking about a quote, as I mentioned Marx before. Uh, let me just find it. I'm going to get there. But basically, this monstrous host, so I don't uh, 
was myself, is oddly reminiscent of um, what Deleuze and Guattari called the body without organs, right? So this is, in one its dimensions, the socius or recording surface that appropriates itself to the entire social product. And in our current conditions, the body without organs, quote, presents its smooth, slippery, opaque surface as a barrier. But beneath this smooth surface, it senses there are larvae, larva and loathsome worms, so many nails piercing the flesh, so many forms of torture, end of quote. In a primary sense, capital is parasitic or vampiric because it lives and grows by expropriating the products of the living labor. But in a secondary existential sense, predatory capital is the basic fact of our existence and we can only survive by becoming in turn parasitic upon it. Uh, there was also like a, a science fiction um, book called Phyllis Genesis by uh, Paul Di Filippo. That was also one reference uh, for this work, uh, where it confronts the full sort of monstrosity of capital and especially of the ecological cat catastrophe that it's one of its chief consequences. But it's also a story about living on the face of this monstrosity as the story promises us from the beginning, life is tenacious, life is ingenious, life is mutable, life is fecund. Um, and then I'm gonna go to the next project. Which is called Nets of Ify. Um I was going to continue uh, Death Grip, um, but then somehow during the pandemic I couldn't go to China for the residency. So I started working on um, this project from 2020, Nets of Ifi. And basically, let me just get this. I'm gonna show you some images of the installation. Okay, so I'm just gonna go for this one. Um, Nets of Ify, um, it was also a, um, an installation that was composed by four different videos. There was like a series of 10 drawings and the sound installation is also like around the space with 15 channels. So um, the idea of sort of like continuing to to research and and uh, uh, a fungi in this case, but also to kind of like look into this sort of alien parasite relationships, I found another species that I was really interested about, which is called uh, Clavicets purpuri. I don't know, you probably heard about it um, since the um, LSD was also synthesized uh, from this fungi uh, in the 40s, 1940s. But I was also very interested in the fact that um, there was a very interesting proximity of um, the fungus cycle with the human body. So for example, Clavisex purpurea is called usually ergot. It's like a fungus that grows in um, uh, cereal plants and it can infest, like contaminate full plantations. So it's not, um, it's not very, um, Weird to believe that in the Middle Ages, for example, uh, people used to have a lot of um, symptoms of like contaminated flour or fermented drinks like beer, etc., because of the ergo itself. So this is a this is a kind of a fungus that um, contaminates the plant. So the way it contaminates the reproductive uh, system of the plant is very similar in the way it contaminates the human body. So 
the the history of this fungi is that its usage was pretty much um, destined to like uh, um, treatments um, like you know abortions or post um, giving birth bleeding, which is also very common uh, to to you know to provoke death and like other sorts of like complications. But um, I'm going to play you a couple of videos from this show, which talks a little bit about this this um, relationships. And so basically, I'm going to play them together. It's going to be the Oracle first, and then Cyanovan, uh, which was made in collaboration with um, Paula Pin, uh, which is a collaborator and a biohacker from Spain.
going to show you um, Cyanovan now. I'm not going to have time to show you the Ciguatera project, the one I did in Venice last year, uh, but we'll see how much time we have after this. And then we can talk uh, later if you need to ask me something. I need to put this one on. As conexións co transhack feminismo pois, viñeron dadas por contextos específicos, colaborativos, no que eh, diferentes persoas que hackeaban o xénero ou que hackeaban tecnoloxía xuntábamos e facíamos aí laboratorios comuns. No? Pois traballos a mellor que tiñan unha, eh, unha pegada máis individual a xuntarse nunha rede de entramados, é dicir, vale, coas cousas de bioloxía... Podemos comenzar, aparte de mirar las plantas, ya teníamos mirado los fluxos de todo el cuerpo, tal, no sé qué, entonces yo digo como idea de trabajar los aspectos de la ginecología autogestionada. ¿no? Foi interessante tu voltas à, à Galiza e também trabalhar com, com a terra aqui, não é? Porque eu também senti que a partir do momento que voltei a Portugal e, e me interessei um, um pouco pela história do, do Ergo, ter presença em várias histórias ligadas à, às plantações e à terra, à, às mulheres agricultoras que de alguma maneira um, estiveram um, numa espécie de zoom no momento em que a Europa tinha várias guerras, não é? Tipo, é estamos a pensar em retomar um pouco o conhecimento desta planta, que acabou por ser uh, invisibilizada pela descoberta do LSD em laboratórios, não é? por esse processo de sintetização. Então, centramos nesses processos contínuos de sintetização, o que é que se, o que é que se perde pelo caminho? Não é? História oral, o processo de transformação, o processo alquímico. da coleta dos oh, wow. laboratórios Sauter Sociedade Anónima são pedacinhos de corpo e coisinhas assim testículo, riñão <risos> aí também tem que vejiga vejiga tiroides merda, não saquei tiroides está como um jogo ah, já se estão despegando as coisas hein? estamos en realidad uh -huh. sí especulando de algo que pasó no, no, no pasado cómo transportar esto presente pero tenemos que tener claro si no hay un sustituto si no hay una cosa medio sabe qué quiero decir tal más con una planta que tiene problemas na, no ámbito de la medicina por intoxicación sí, claro. no por <risa> Sendo que esta, esta planta é espontânea, tipo, é selvagem, então é como se auto, auto plantasse sozinha, sabes?
Daí as moléculas estão abrindo, então o processo de extração do alcaloide vai se facilitar, né? Assim, se... Há uma imagem que não sei onde anda agora, mas... É, assim, smell my finger. Sim, sim. Para interpretar qual é, qual é, são qual as, a, a, a tipo de infecções. colonização de um microorganismo sobre outro no seu corpo. Né? Sim. Não passa da, da, da liberação dos friacaloides. Então sim. está está tudo aí. Né? Tá. O que vai fazer isto agora é fazer a extração a través do solvente que vai ser o alcohol o etanol que a gente vai poner aqui né? Sim. nunca os cogumelos tiveram um, um contido recreacionista senão que é um contido de, de reconexão com a terra tá? não sei que são, são um, usados no tradicional temos sobre com o nosso corpo não é? até muito Parece tempo foi, foi considerado como uma planta não é? portanto não é um é um não, um porque reino, um animal. de feito é, eu acho que é um, que é um híbrido tem uma bombinha aqui dentro da água esse é o circuito uhum. então isto é simplesmente para refrigerar vale? Preciso pôr na posição. Uhum. Ah, não, não preciso estar com o problema. Sim, está seguro. Vou ter um segundo. Então, a coisa é que quando isto este esteja eh, no ponto de fusão, vai vir por aqui, por o tubo grande, deste daqui. Vai entrar aqui e vai entrar aqui. Então a condensação vai fazer que isto todo vou baixar por este tubinho daqui, vai subir tal, e volta por o tubinho pequeno. Okay. Esse sistema chama-se como percolation, percolação. Isso como que tarda agora 3, 4 horas, fazer o, o processo completo. Okay. E a base do alcaloide fica toda na parte de baixo? A cor é linda. Sim, a cor é linda. E depois podemos guardar ah, Agora, o resto do pó e uma solução já de extração. Como? Agora temos dois tipos de. Temos dois tipos de remédio. A forma que, que encontramos para colaborar também partiu de fazer um estudo profundo da planta, do, do ciclo do parasita com o fungo e como é que esta planta se relaciona com a saúde da mulher. Eu achei interessante tu falar do plátano, não é? Sim. Tal como com a mandrágora, Sim. eram tratamentos utilizados por healers e pelos monges, Sim. pelos peregrinos, para tratar o, o ergotismo, não é? Que não estamos, que não somos humanos de células, que nosso corpo está composto por alga, bactérias, fungos, ou seja, não somos só humanos, não? Então, o contido de interespícies já está uh, inscrito no, 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 quando nascemos, né? o que faz a cultura antropocêntrica é pensar que o humano é humano, é o fungo é o fungo, e tem o poderio de classificá-lo todo e ponhá-lo como em casillas, mas um pouco como para poder entendê-lo. Né? Então, a desconexão isso que temos agora com a natureza, provocada pelo sistema reducionista da ciência capitalizada e pelo patriarcal, pues, bueno, pues fez toda tipo de conexão, mira, a quarta volta. Aí vai, 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 vai. Não, 
realms of free technology is like you can copy, paste, replicate, imitate, proceed. Eu fico como pensando, como não posso, não posso responder, estamos a fazer uma, um healing do futuro e tal, não sei o que, eu não tenho como suficiente conhecimento para dizer, venha, vamos fazer isso porque isso vai funcionar. Sabe o que eu quero dizer? Olha, uh, é preciso pôr isto numa lâmina. Não é dolor, não é dolor. Isto uh, vamos a ponerlo em um. Precisas que eu uh, ponha isso em algum lado? Mariana, são 8 menos um quarto. Sim, vamos fazer. Podes... A ti, Mariana, bueno, pode ser, porque vamos pôr isto num bote e chave. Sim, sim. Agora o que fazemos? Levamos para a janta. Agora temos uma luz auxiliar que antes não está. <risos> Esta la estaba buscando antes, pero es que son demasiadas cosas. Sí, es que... A ver... Ay, no, mira. Ok, so basically, um, I wanted to... I have to finish uh, now so I can... Uh, we can do a break and then the other artists will come. But the, um, this collaboration also resulted with the fact that the, the ergo market uh, in Portugal and Spain was very important uh, during a time um, during the the civil war in Spain and also with the Russian war where especially because Russia was responsible to trade the most part of the ergo for um, pharmaceutical companies and corporations uh, so there's this whole sort of like constellation of stories around how uh, this resource uh, circulated but also how it ended up uh, falling into uh, Albert Hoffman's lab. Um, so thank you so much for uh, having me again, and um, we can talk a little bit later. Thank you. <laughs>